Hello, and welcome back. I am so glad you could join me for another chapter of The Legend of Luke. We are rolling along, and we will finish this book. Only a few chapters left to go. I already have plans for what to do next, so stick around if you want to know about those. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll bring this back. Links to support are in the description, but you don't have to. Not at this point. <laughs> With that, got my water, got my book, let's jump back in to another chapter of the le- it's a very, it's a very creaky chair, I don't know how much of it's coming across on the mic. <laughs> to another chapter of The Legend of Luke by Brian Jakes. Chapter 36. The honeysuckle skimmed southward like a playful swallow, Logalog Fermo proudly showing off her prowess as a skiff to the four creatures from the Arf ship. Martin sat in the prow, enjoying the sun, sea spray, and breeze with his faithful friend Gonf alongside him. Together, they listened to Trimp attempting to chide Chugger for his lack of respect to the elders. I'll not tell you again, Chug. Stop calling her friends old grandpas. It's not very good manners. Cha-cha! You don't know nothing. A good old grandpa's for Chug. We making our skilly duffs for him. Fulgrim and Dinny had been appointed assistant cooks, helping Chugger to cook skilly and duff. They were on his side. Maester Chugger bain't doing no harm, missy. Bait that right, sir, Vol. Aye, let the little tag be, miss. He ain't never had a grandpa. <laughs> now he's got four of them. Trimp appealed to Verg and his friends. Please forgive, Chugger. I hope he hasn't offended you. There, there, don't fret, young girl. What? He could call us blather-faced broters as long as he keeps feeding us. <laughs> Jolly little rip, ain't he, Verg? Ah, and seeing as we've got no families of our own, tis nice to be chosen as grand size by him. Ahoy oh, there, Captain Chug. Is our skelly and duff ready yet? The small squirrel gave his concoction a final stir and licked the ladle. Nodding brusquely, he issued orders. Skilly duff, cook it now. Mr. Foe, Mr. Din, give old Grandpa some first. Miss Trent, you serve the rest of my crew. Martin and Gonf had difficulty keeping straight faces as they accepted their bowls from Trimp. The hedgehog maid was quietly seething. Bush-tailed little villain, who does he think he is? Issuing orders to me as if, I, as if I was some sort of lackey. Martin blew upon his spoon as he tasted the food. Hmm, he does make great skillions off, though. What do you think, Gonf? Never tasted better, matey. You reckon Chug had adopt us old grandpas? No, nah, we're a bit young for that. Why don't we apply to be uncles like Fulgrim and Dinny? Trimp stamped off to serve the gausim shrews, muttering, I don't know. Every beast aboard this boat has got that cheeky-faced villain spoiled rotten. Chugger's latest order interrupted her rebellious musing. Find more bows for the shoes, Miss Trimp. Trimp turned on Chugger, paws akimbo, shouting shrilly, Yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. Perhaps you'd like me to scrub the decks and polish the oars. Chugger's reply left her speechless. No, no, don't do that later. Just stop shouting for now. My old grandpas are going to take naps. Hush your noise now. It was some days later, and the weather was getting noticeably warmer. Fermo steered the honeysuckle closer inshore, hallooing the creature standing paw deep in the shallows. Dune Spark, old mate, how are ya? Splashing about joyfully, the fat old dune hog chieftain hailed the boat. Sure, and I'm all the better for your asking, Fermo. Come ashore now and rest your old fur. Willing paws helped haul the honeysuckle above the tide line. Murpho and a gang of young male hedgehogs fell over each other, assisting Trimp ashore. Faith and fortunes, Missy, but you're looking grand, grand, prettier than ever, though I say so myself. Trimp grabbed an oar and vaulted over them onto the sand. Aye, and still well able to take care of myself, thank ye. Martin seized Dune Spike's paws and pumped it heartily. Greetings, Chief. You're looking very well. True, true. I'm getting younger by the day. Plump as a pear and brisk as a bumblebee. Well now, come up to the dwelling and loosen off your belt. We've been watching out each day for a glimpse of your grand little boat. 
Sure, and the cooks are roasting the paws off themselves to make you a grand old supper. You think we'll ever be able to fill Gump's belly tonight? <laughs> How are you doodling there, mouse thief? Gaunt fell into the dune hog speech mode. Sure, and if an eye took it as grand as yourself, then I'm twice the mouse I used to be, sir. Linking paws and chattering away happily, crew and dune hogs made their way to the sand hills and entered the cunningly disguised dwelling house. Bo and his friends were quite impressed by it all, and the hare expressed his admiration to all the young hedgehogs while shielding Trip from them. I say, what a super wheeze! A jolly great place like this inside a sand dune, what? Well done, you chaps. Top marks! One of the young males was winking slyly at Trimp. Sure, and I'd forgotten how pretty you are. A hog had traveled ten rough country leagues and not see the likes of you. I wager you could charm the stars out of the skies with just a flutter of those eyelashes. Bo pretended to think the dune hog was talking to him. He tweaked the creature's ear sharply. Kind your manners, sir. We haven't even been introduced. What? You seem jolly perceptive for a hedgehog. Mind you, I do strike quite a handsome impression upon most creatures. The Honeysuckle's crew found that the Dune Hog hospitality was not lacking. For supper they dined on a fine leek and potato soup, followed by mushroom radis and seafood stew, and with an enormous fruit trifle for dessert. After that they set about drinking cordials and sea foam ale while they were entertained by a spine-tussling expedition some lively dune hog reels and jigs, and various poems, recitations, and ballads. Trimp sat with a group of hog maids, and they all flirted outrageously with the young males, who danced and spine tussled to vie for their attention. Martin sat with Dune Spike and Fermo, watching them with amusement. Fermo gestured toward them with a stankard. Thought you wish you were there, Ige again, chief. Dune Spike shook his great head until the sp his great head until the spikes rattled. Away with you! I do not. They're completely mad, all of them. I'd sooner have it and drink any day. Martin gave Dune Spike a friendly shove. You old fogey, look at him. They're young and happy. Not a care on earth. Good luck to them, I say. Eh, hey, Fermo? The Gaussim chief nodded his agreement. They don't have our problems, mate. We've got to figure out how to get a boat of the honeysuckle size up a waterfall and past a pine wood full of painted savages. Aye. Even if we get by that lot, we'll still be battling upstream against the current. It's going to be difficult, to say the least. Dune Spike poured himself some cordial. Well, then why don't you find another route? <laughs> Easy said, Chief. But is there another route? Hmm. Let me think. Ah, now, what about North Fork? Fermo stared over the, ring of his, the rim of his tankard at Dune Spike. North Fork? Does it run this far? Sure it does. All in two days, good poor slog from here. Fermo called across to Fulgrim. Oi, mate, do you know the North Fork stream? The scarred otter left off contending for the remains of the trifle with Bo. Aye, I know the North Fork stream right enough. I never travelled up it. I was reared at the southern end of that stream. It's where my holt is at. Fermo thumped the rush mat they were seated on. Of course! Joins up to the stream we sailed here on, about three days down from our tribe's summer camp. Just one thing, though. How are we going to get the honeysuckle overland to the North Fork stream? Dune Spike shug shrugged his powerful shoulders. And I was put to carry it. Sure, me and the Dune Hogs will end a poor to the job. Fine lot we'd be if we could not <laughs> help out. That's what friends are for. Martin clasped paws with the good old hog chief. Uh, you certainly are a great friend to us, sir. Dune Spike's huge frame shook with merriment. Sure, and I wouldn't risk being anything else to a warrior who can wield a sword like you, Martin of Redwall. By first light next morning, they were all down on the beach. Dune Spike had slept on the idea and awakened with a brilliant solution. Martin and the crew stood on one side, watching as the hedgehog chieftain put his scheme into action. Two sets of wheels on axles were trundled out from somewhere in the dunes. Dune Spike called out orders. Hey now, Murpho, you and the lads attend to them wheels. Martin, get that grand old crew of yours on the starboard side, and I'll take the port side with my crowd. Paddles and stout poles were thrust under beneath the skiff's flat bottom to emerge the other side. Every beast took a firm hold of them. Dune Spike roared out. Are you fit now? Lift! 
The honeysuckle rose clear of the sand as they lifted. Murpho and the young ones rolled the wheels in, forward and aft. Uh, that's good! Back it down now, easy! Two dune hogs with big staples and mallets fixed the axles in position beneath the boat. Dinny whispered to Trimp, Hurry, <laughs> boat don't sail on his seas, so he likes it. Yon dune spiker be a greatly intelligent hog, burly. There was some minor trouble getting the wheeled vessel through the dunes and off the soft sand. However, once they hauled her up through a low gap in the clifftop, the going was good. It was fairly flat scrubland, grass, and hard-packed earth, and there was no call to use the pulling ropes. With her sail up, Honeysuckle caught the wind and rolled along unaided. Bo and the other three elders were aboard her, with Dune Spike, Trimp, and Chugger. The rest trotted alongside, sometimes even having to tug on the tow ropes to slow the Honeysuckle's progress. Gonf laughed. Just think, if there was no woodlands twixt there and Wedroll, we could have sailed on by land! Later in the afternoon, the land began a mild uphill slope and the breeze died completely. They split into two parties, one forward pulling in the tow ropes and the rest at the stern pushing. But the skiff still ran fairly smooth on its wheels, so it would have been no great effort were it not for Chucker. The little squirrel had attached a gull feather to a pole, and he dashed back and forth, tickling the pullers and pushers mercilessly and haranguing them. Come on, come on, run, make her go plenty faster, or Captain Chug will tickle your tails off. Trimp decided she had put up with enough. Looping a line about the tormentor, she relieved him of the pole and tied him to the mast. Chugger set up an immediate clamor. Aye, Captain, let me go! Help me, old grandpa's Mr. Den, Mr. Foe! Help, Chug! But no help was forthcoming. Quite the opposite, in fact. Bo took hold of the feathered pole and began tickling his adopted grand squirrel. See how you like it, sir! What? Silence now, or I'll jolly well tickle the tip of your nose and make you sneeze whole season. What do you say to that, Captain Chug? Chop your tail off, Bo, and Chug not make you a no more skilly duff. Bo slumped down beside Verg, nodding sadly. No skilly and duff? Uh, what? Ah, well, such is the fate of a blinking mutineer, eh, chap? That night they set up camp in the lee of a wide stone outcrop at the base of a hill. Logalog Vermo sat looking at the honeysuckles speculatively. You know, Gonf, think I'll leave those wheels on her. Won't do no harm to a flat bottom boat like the honeysuckle. <laughs> and wait till my missus sees our new boat. She'll be proud as a toad with a top hat. Fulgrim had been to the top of the hill to see what the going would be like the next day. On his return, the otter called Martin and Dune Spike to hit to one side. I think I just spotted trouble on the other side of this hell. The warrior mouse became instantly alert. What sort of trouble, Fulgrim? Bunch of ragtag vermin, boxes, stouts, and the like. Martin was away uphill swiftly, sword and paw. Let's go and take a look. Bellying down, the three friends crawled over the hilltop. Below them, on the gorse strewn plain, several small fires were burning. There was little need to investigate further, for by the light of the half moon, they could estimate the numbers of foe beasts below. Dunespike had seen the same band before. They were sniffing around our dunes last winter, but we covered our tracks, and we got the young and safe inside the old dwelling. So myself and some others put on our sheets and stilts and scared the bluggards off. What do you think we should do about him, Martin? Without hesitation, the warrior answered. We could defeat them in a fight, but there's no sense in that. I want every beast to reach their home safe. Listen now. I think I've got a solution to the problem. Skipper perched high above the south gable, his footpaws firmly lodged in a roof beam gap. From where he stood, the otter chieftain could see out over the countless acres of moss flower wood to the east. He turned slowly, looking across the vast plain to the west. Rat me, rudder, what a sight! I know why birds are singing happily. Everything looks so different from up here. He shut his eyes momentarily as he caught sight of Lady Amber walking along the topmost scaffold pole as if it were a broad roadway. Ma'am, I beg ye, would you mind not doing that till I'm back in the ground? Something inside me just did a somersault. The Squirrel Queen leapt lightly down beside him. Sorry, Skip, I forgot there was a land dweller up here. Is the weather vane ready yet? Nearly. 
Oh, Ferdy and Cogs are doing a fine job of smithy in his eye ever saw him, I. Though Miss Columbine says there won't be a scrap of charcoal left in the kitchens to cook with. They're using the open hearth fire to heat the iron and beat it out on the stone floor. I came up here because I couldn't abide the noise. Ding! Bang! Ding! Bang! My poor old head's still ringing inside. Lady Amber was more practical than sympathetic. Don't tell me, Skip, you can't abide noise. <laughs> Tis usually you who creates the most noise around here with your big foghorn voice. As for heights, if you haven't got a head for them, I don't advise hanging around up here. You'll only make yourself ill. Why not pop down to the orchard and help the carpenters? That's far more peaceful. Skipper tugged on the pulley rope of the hoist. Good idea, ma'am. The orchard it is. The, ho <laughs> the hoist was merely a system of counterweights. Skipper stepped aboard a small platform and it descended slowly. On the way down, he was passed by the other platform, on which stood a squirrel with two blocks of sandstone going up. They waved to each other as the platforms passed. Where are you buying, Skip? Down to the orchard, matey, to lend a paw with the beams. Tell Girdle to load mortar on the platform when you get down. I'll leave one of those blocks on as a counterweight. A mole and four mice were waiting at the bottom, and they locked off the platform against a log protruding from the wall. The mole touched his snout in greeting. They need more blocks up there, Skip. The otter stepped down from the platform. Not at present, Girdle. Tis mortar they want. Girdle and the mouse and the mice began shoveling a mixture of sand, crushed limestone, and water onto the platform. It would enable the builders to cement the heavy sandstone blocks firmly into place. At the far corner of Redwall's orchard, the carpenters had set up shop. A pit had been dug so that they could cut planking with long, double-ended saws, and there was a bench with a vice, chiseled, chisels and mallets, as well as a fire with augers and pokers resting in it. These would be used to bore holes so that the wood could be jointed with pegs. Seasoned trunks of elm, oak, beech, pine, and sycamore were stacked against the wall in piles. Skipper loved the fragrant smell of fresh wood and heaps of bark shavings. A fat, whiskery old bankful with a charcoal stick behind one ear and a long canvas apron glanced up from a pine log he was working on and nodded at the otter chieftain. Afternoon, Skip. Do you fancy helping me strip the bark off of this timber? It'll make good skitting boards for the upper dormitories. I like pine, but a fragrance all of its own. Skipper found a spokeshave and began working on the other side of the log. Long pine slivers ran curling from his sharp blade, and Skipper sniffed fondly. You're right, Miglo. It is a clean, fresh smell. I feel it clearing up my head nicely. A dormouse popped her head up from the paw pit. Hello, Skip. How's it going on the south gable? I spotted you up there earlier. You know, you wouldn't get me anywhere that high. Not for all the nuts and moss flower, matey. Skipper blew off a shaving that had stuck to his nose. Aye, I'll leave that to the squirrels and a gang of crazy mice and hedgehogs who like that sort of thing. Well, I tell you, ma'am, I was surprised how far they'd gotten along. Lady Amber says another couple of days should bring it to a peak. Then they can set up the weather vane. Miglo chuckled gruffly through his bushy whiskers. Amber squirrels are uh, setting up no weather vane. Tis Ferdy and Cogs will be doing that. <laughs> Wait till you see those two bulky old cellar rogs waving about up there. They ain't looking forward to it, I can tell you. Skipper smiled at the thought of Redwall's twin cellar hogs high on the south gable. No, nor would I fancy it. Carrying a big earthenware jug and beakers on a tray between them, Mayberry and Catkin the otter maids awkwardly bobbed curtsies to all the workers. Miss Bella said to bring you a cool drink, meat leaf and rosehip cordial from the cellars. She said it washed the sawdust down, sir. Miglo swigged a half-full beaker in one go. Just the stuff. Cold and nice and very refreshing. Thank you. Skipper sipped his drink slowly, relishing it. The otter maids topped up his beaker. We didn't know you were a carpenter, Grandpa. He winked at them. Just shows you me please. You don't know half the things your old grandpa can do. Oh, yes, we do. We know lots of things you can do. Do you now? Like what? We know you can hide underwater in the pond when it's your turn to wash pots and dishes. Yes, and we know you can wake every beast when you talk in your sleep with your big loud voice. And we know you can sup more hot root soup than any beast and drink more October, la October ale and scoff more dams and puddin'. The otter chieftain squinted fiercely at his two young granddaughters as he advanced on them. Ha <laughs> ha! Me pretties, and did you know that I can clip the noses off little otter maids with Miss Bokeshave? 
They fled squealing and giggling from the orchard. That evening it went cool suddenly. Standing in the outer wall ramparts of the abbey, Bella and Columbine watched the enchanting sight of summer's last evening. Streaked to the west, slim dark cloud tails, the sunset was awesome. In the final moments, the skies turned deep scarlet on the horizon, ranging up through crimson and rose to a delicate pink. Above this, it faded to a broad band of buttery amber with soft, dark blue pierced by the faint twinkle of early stars. Columbine let her breath out in a long, wistful sigh. I hope my gunf can see all this beauty. Bella placed a paw gently on her friend's shoulder. I'm sure he can. I know he'll be thinking of you and the little ones here at Redwall, awaiting his return. A random thought caused the mousewife to cover her mouth, stifling a chuckle. Lest there's food to be had, of course. Gonf would soon a case at a fruit puddin' than a sunset. Bella joined her in the laughter. And I suggest we post a daily lookout on this wall from now on. No doubt we can accommodate his sense of beauty with a big apple pie. And that is where we will end it tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you tune in next week. Closing down on the end of this book. And we're going to get there. If you enjoyed it, hope you tune in again. Subscribe if you want, but yeah, you know. None of this is real. It's all on the internet. Take care. Hope to see you next week. Stay safe. Be well. Bye-bye.